there's buildings and trees in the UK that are older than your country. It's true. But when you ask a British person about the building or the tree, they'll lie to you about it. You know, I live in East London. Half of it wasn't destroyed by the Germans, like the locals will tell you. The locals from Essex will tell you. The truth is, the British pulled it all down because they can't stand the side of anything that's more than 50 years old because they're so ashamed of it. I've been lied to about the age of the building I live in in London so many times. Well, it's from the 1930s. It's from the 1880s. It's from the 1950s. When the f*** is it? Nobody knows. <laughs> it's all been made up. At least our history is new enough that we can't fake it. Tomorrow is my first Thanksgiving. Yes. Ever. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know why you celebrate it. I don't know what to expect. All that I see are memes about how to insult or have difficult conversations with your family members around the dinner table. So can right. you give me a guide for how to survive Thanksgiving, please? Well, it's an adult outing. Now, I don't mean just leaving your house and going outdoors. I mean outing yourself to your family in all sorts of ways, politically, in terms of sexuality and gender, too. There'll be a lot of trans exploration at Thanksgiving this year because everyone's trans. There's millions of them, so we got to look out. They're there. There's one at the table. So, yeah, there's lots of trans. So expect a trans at your Thanksgiving. It's transgiving this year, by the way, is what we're calling it. Transgiving, by the way. Um, yeah, uh, people um, kill animals and, and barbecue them and then eat them and try to avoid, with their mouth full of food, talking to their family members. I sit at the dining table across from my dad and wait for him to take his last breath. So I don't have to do stand up live anymore because that old fucker has so much money will not spend it on me. But yes, what it mostly is, is a chance for people to get together and pretend it's not Christmas around the corner. So there's no gifts. There's just food. You shove it in. You pass out near the dining table and then you wake up an hour later and say, I got to go. I'm so full. You drive home. That's what it is. Or you fall down on the floor. You're so you're so full. You lay down on your brother's living room floor and wait for people to pass by so you look up their skirts but you don't really want to see most of it so yeah it's that there's that there's skirt viewing but it's mostly just a time i think it's a four-day holiday it's uh, a shopping season because black friday happens on the friday after christmas after thanksgiving so that's what people are really most looking forward to i like thanksgiving because halloween's my favorite uh, festival holiday but thanksgiving my second because it's just about the food and you don't have to worry about gift giving yet and I like the food. It's a nice, turkey's nice. Some people have ham. Communists eat pheasant or fish or lobster, which is fucked up. But a lot of people do that. Where you're from, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, meat on the offer because Texans love their barbecue. And barbecue turkey is good. Um, yeah, it's, about, it's a holiday about um, responding to how lucky we are to have escaped uh, European dominance. People, people left... Europe in the 18th, the, well, the 16th, 17th, 18th century to, for um, religious freedom. And um, that's what they're celebrating. They said, thank you, God, that we don't have to uh, eat with the English anymore. Is that and why? We, and I've now been invited. So it's basically a victory party for your nation over my nation. And I've been invited back around. Yes, they're going to kill you. So you is this going to be like that Get Out movie where that they invite that one black guy around and then it's a, yeah. a big game where they all try and kill him? Yeah, it'll be it'll <laughs> be like that. I mean, I you know I think people have forgotten the the uh, the truth about the holiday season, which really was um, some people came from Europe and took away some land from some indigenous people, killed them with disease, or uh, murdered all their children to make sure they couldn't populate. And then celebrated that. So we're trying to um, not celebrate the truth. But this is where the critical race theory comes in. I think people, kids don't really understand what the holiday season's about because it'll ruin their stuffing and their cranberry sauce. And where all that comes from, I don't know. Don't ask me where the cranberry sauce comes from. Again, that's an English thing, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. But I think it, what I used to like about the holidays too, Thanksgiving, Christmas, is they, they used to open films on these days in America. All the cinemas we open, and I go to movies with my family. It was really fun. But that's kind of not happening this year either, I think, because of COVID. And does anyone go to the movies anymore? I don't think anyone does. Man, I don't know. I went to go and see... What was the last movie I went to go and see? I can't even remember. I wanted to go and see the James Bond, the new James Bond, and then someone told me that it was terrible, so I didn't bother to go and see that. I wanted to go see some new Marvel thing. Yeah, it was empty. Absolutely empty. Yeah. I mean, we're watching a Mexican soap opera tomorrow all day i think it's hilarious it's called the house of flowers it's so 
funny. And uh, my husband's Brazilian, so he's a big fan of Mexican TV. And uh, some of my relatives are Mexican. And they're indigenous people as well. So when I see them, we don't really talk much about the joy of Thanksgiving. And they tend to bring pre-made packaged microwave food to their festive events. Yeah. Is that, so, do you think uh, that's a little bit of a slight on the I, holiday at large? It might be. Yeah, yeah, it might be. But it's a big deal to my husband because he believes in, oh, he's gone. He believes in family. It's weird. It's fucked up. He just saw some of his family in Ecuador because he wanted to. It's so weird to me. Like he sees them out of joy and happiness and union, a bond. It really Not out of obligation. Sense. Yeah, it's, yeah. Or because you want a new car, because you want to brag about what you make for a living. So we're seeing my family tomorrow. We've been harassed and kidnapped, basically, emotionally. So we have to go see them for a few hours. He'll complain in the car all the way there. But it's mostly because he doesn't understand why there's a room full of people who hate each other so much. When he first met my family, he's like, I've never been around much uh, in a room full of people who clearly could barely stand the smell or stench of each other. I'm like, well, happy Christmas. I mean, my, the, the nice people in my family died because they were nice. They were murdered. So now it's just it's the gangsters and the mafia left. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> if we survive, I'll be happy. Italians all sit. They, my family will not sit with their backs to the windows because they're too afraid of being shot from outdoors. My father, his whole house only has windows on one side. That's why he bought it. He never goes to restaurants with windows in them, and he never pays with credit cards. He's too afraid of being traced. This is the mood I share Thanksgiving with my family in. They're, why they're, are you they're, part they're of all, the Sicilian mafia? Yeah, they're illegal importers and extra exporters. That's how they made their money. It's all, it's all public with my family. They don't, they're not ashamed of it. They're proud of it. Since the Sopranos, they're like local celebrities in the small towns where they live. Jesus. That's why they wear a black tie on holidays. It's, it's weird, but they do it. They wear black ties and black jackets because they want everyone to know who they are. Wow. They're, they're muscle people. It's scary. So I can I imagine you fitting them. right in with a bunch of murderers and hitmen and they extortionists. The no, they like the gay thing because they're, they're comfortable leaving us alone with their wives while they go, go outside and smoke marijuana in the driveway. Because they know we won't hit on anybody. They do. We can go shopping with their wives. They're fine with that. We're like we're like gay bodyguards. Right, honey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they love it when we're there because my husband's great with kids. So they leave their meatloafs alone with my husband. And he builds a fake bar for them, makes little drinks and like little grown-ups. And, you know, they go and make phone calls and deal drugs internationally. And they, they come back to ours later like, can you bring him to the next fifth? Because they don't like their kids either. They fucking hate their kids. Most people do. And so. people used, it seems like a lot of my buddies that are more personally development inclined are using this as an opportunity to do an end of year review to kind of gratitude and such. That would be something typically that we would do around New Year's Eve in the UK. Is that, do people not use it as a time to reflect the Thanksgiving, the gratitude thing? You know, it's, it's really sweet, only worldly of you to say, but we're all about moving forward. Like I said earlier, we've got a world to run here in the US. So it's move, 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 fast, 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 out of my way. In fact, half the people I see at family functions or even in clubs or bars when I'm working are on their phones all the time, buying and selling. This country's about uh, modern, not the past. In fact- Well, that's because you don't have any past. There's, there's buildings and trees in the UK that are older than your country. It's true. But when you ask a British person about the building or the tree, they'll lie to you about it. That's the thing about the British. They've got a past. But it's made up. I mean, every, you know, I live in East London and half, half of it wasn't destroyed by the Germans, like the locals will tell you, it, you know, the locals from Essex will tell you. What, what the truth is, the British pulled it all down because they can't stand the side of it anything that's more than 50 years old because they're so ashamed of it. I've been lied to about the age of the building I live in in London so many times. We've had so many. Oh, it's from the 1930s. It's from the 1880s. It's from the 1950s. When the fuck is it? Nobody knows. <laughs> it's all been made up. <laughs> at least our history is new enough that we can't fake it. I mean, I know what you mean. I mean, in Austin, there should be quite a history. Um, but again, I think they tear everything down. And which, it, I mean, in a way, a lot of my British friends come here. What they like so much about it is how new and clean everything seems to be, except in San Francisco. I mean, we have a real homeless problem here that people tend to ignore and dismiss because it's the wealth. It's both the wealthiest and the poorest part of the u.s where i live here there was a man walking so in america there are these lanes at least in texas there are these lanes in the middle of the street and they're ones that are used by people that are going to turn left or right and they're like fe feeder lanes or turning lanes or something and yeah. um when i go down south lamar in austin that street always has 
around about every 500 meters or so, a homeless person walking along with a, with a little cardboard sign. Uh, and that makes me sad. But then twice now, in 10 days that I've been here, I've seen somebody who is naked, a homeless person who is naked with the sign, but only naked from the waist down. Oh, right. So fully dressed up top with a bag, but then one lady who had her vagina out and then one gentleman who was just fully swinging in the wind. And uh, yeah. I just, I think that's hard to ignore. I don't know how you mentioned that people in San Francisco can ignore the homeless problem. It was difficult for me to ignore the lady's vagina. Well, that's, that's, uh, but not the swinging penis. That was your, 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 that's just part of the course, you know? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's why they're doing it because they feel ignored. Um, and the winter's coming up, <laughs> but I, I also, yes. In fact, I'm surprised they were just standing on your Island. We call them islands. Um, and the islands here in, in California, they're living and they're in the middle of the road. They're raising children. Yeah. It's, it can be very difficult. Yes. So um, when you're trying I, to make a left, when you try to make a left turn down on at least 46th or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's someone that's you know they're 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 frying their a family of five things. in the way. Seriously, it it's you know when I I've, I've been in India a few times for work and you do see people on the street there who have been living there for generations. That's their corner, um, and it's becoming it's on that way here wow. in the U.S. And it's the disparity of wealth that creates such a such a, a, a disproportionate population i don't yeah, i'm a bit i it, it's not just a shame that i feel i mean of course i feel a shame that i live in a culture and in a planet that lets that happen but it's 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 a it's a confusion i have because i'm not quite sure why i live in a place i live very close to silicon i mean basically silicon valley where i live and i i work and live with people who are making millions billions a house just sold near us for $1.5 million over the asking price. $1.5 million over what they were asking. So that's the kind of money that you see here, right? So why these people can make that kind of money, creating an app that allows them to get a pizza and the taxi on the way home, but which is genius, great for them. But they can't use that, you know, Harvard graduation uh promise of cleaning up the world to fucking fix the biggest problem that's on their doorstep that they bitch to their families about all the time. Ooh, someone's on my doorstep and they're shitting on my car. They got a, a needle in my, in their arm. Well then fix it, fix it. How about paying your taxes? Or what I don't get is why is we're all part of the problem. We're, you and I are doing it right now. We're on Skype. Why we're using social media to celebrate how great we, each of us are to discuss our own egos on this podcast for 60 minutes. But <laughs> but we don't see a Skype opera house or a Facebook cinema or an Amazon homeless shelter ever, ever. These companies are here because they get tax breaks. They don't pay anything. I go on, on and on about this, but I don't understand. I, 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 I understand as much as you do. The homeless so problem, road, it, it certainly seems to be a little bit different in the US as it is in the UK. There's, I don't know, in the US, maybe it's because of the weather that mm -hmm. people can't settle as much in the UK, or maybe it's that there's fewer fewer of them, or maybe just the culture, the subculture of homeless people is different. You have more of a safety net. You do. My husband's from Brazil. I'm from here. Us living in London, we know that. I mean, I know the safety net's being dismantled by, the, by, by you know, BJ. But I know that's happening, but in the meantime... You at least have some. There's a, you know, behind our house in London, there's an ex prostitute. I know that because she used to chase me down the street as I was going into my house. I'm like, honey, you're, you're barking up the wrong elm, seriously. Uh, I don't pay for it and I don't pay for pussy, especially. That's just my. <laughs> but, but she was quite aggressive. And now she lives behind us with her husband, one of her Johns, who she married, and she has three kids that she's raising with him. And we see that. And we know they're dealing drugs out of their kitchen window, which they kind of have to to pay for their car. But at least. They have a place to live, right? She's raising three. They might, you know, she's got a family. And that, I just, it's not going to happen here. Yeah. You're going to lose your house because you have a medical problem. You know, I, I, and you're not aware of it. And you shouldn't be. You shouldn't have to be. But you've been raised in a country with free health care. And you cannot even imagine how much lighter that makes your life. When my mother died of advanced lung disease, we found a stack of bills on her desk. She was dealing with 
insurance companies until the fucking day she fell asleep and died in her sleep trying to pay off bills so she could breathe. And if you don't have that in your life, you don't just live longer. You don't lose your house. It's not, just, not having nationalized healthcare does mm, feel very barbaric. Coming from a country that has... Yes. You don't even think about it. I remember I went to New Orleans on a road trip a couple of years ago, and the guy that did the tour was very capable. It was one of these Wiccan, Dracula, scary evening tour things, and up here is the ghost of whatever, and it was cool, and you got to drink, so it made it all seem a bit more believable. And this guy was real competent, really, really competent. Big tour company he was doing it for. We tipped him at the end, and we were like, right, well, we want to go out for some beers. He said, oh, well, I also work as a barman at this place. I'm like, hang on, so you do... You're a tour guide of this thing, and also you help the operator, and you're doing the bar. Okay, cool. We'll go to the bar with you. Start chatting to him, and he was. We were talking about this conversation, and he said, "If you get hit by a car, you'd better walk it off because if somebody calls the ambulance to come and pick you up, that can bankrupt you. That can send you into this cycle of debt that so you're now stuck in." Yeah, yeah. And that scared me. This guy's. Real hardworking, you know, two, three, maybe more jobs. He was saying, oh, I've got two cracked teeth at the back, uh, but I'm not, I, I can't pay to get them fixed and I'm not going to get the insurance or whatever to do the thing. I'm like, this is fucking medieval shit. What's going on? Yes. And then it, it and that continues, like you said, you know, until maybe he injures himself. A friend of mine is a psychiatrist at a, a Kaiser hospital, which is a huge local hospital. And he's dealing with um, people with drug addiction. And these are people that have jobs that can't quit. So he tries to get them off the heroin and the crystal. And they've been taking pain medication, some of them, their entire adult lives, because they injured when they were at university playing sport or something. And they can't stop working. They can't take a week or two or four, or they can't go to rehab. They'll lose their jobs, they'll lose their house. It's really vicious. You know, I mean, Edson, my husband and I were so lucky because we aren't caught up in any of this cycle. And is that fundamentally been... fueled by the medical problem? Where does this come from? Because, you know, outside of that, I don't see why America is any more expensive of a place to live than anywhere else. Right. I mean, I think that's it's a complicated situation where people where, where certain language is used to discourage people from socialized health care, like the word socialism. I don't know why it scares a lot of people here. Mm. Although. They get their social security checks every month, but they don't understand the similarity or the difference. And, and I think that people are worried about the, you know, we've heard about death panels where hospitals decide whether or not you live or die. <clears throat> Which frankly does happen in the UK sometimes, but you know, it's not a common occurrence. And if people here would just look at the way the pandemic's been handled by the NHS, how brilliantly they've handled, how, how they saved Boris Johnson's fucking political career, you know, what upsets me, though, is not, it's not just that, too. It's education. I mean, think, it just feels like here, Edson and I notice there's a lack of empathy in the U.S. There just is. There just is. I, and I mean, yes, nationally. You see it on television. You see it in the way people are dealt with socially here locally. You see it in our political system nationally and locally. There is a feeling of you need to look after yourself and take care of yourself. And when we're in France... I, you know, I, I had to live in Italy for a while to get my my citizenship taken care of. When we're living in country, when we when when I stay in Australia for long periods working, I don't sense it there. I feel like the people I know who live here and work here do so because they want to make money. And if you're not a part of that vicious cycle, then get out. If you're not in the economic engine, yeah, I think out. one thing that I've definitely noticed is that. Americans need far less, or at least the Americans that I've been around, need far less of an excuse to treat themselves or to enjoy themselves. I think I'm seeing much less of a Puritan work ethic over here. So you want to go out on an evening time, you go for some mm -hmm. food or whatever. Someone doesn't have to earn the right to be able to go and do that. Now, that may be because I'm from quite a working class, salt of the earth place in the UK, and Austin is kind of, every other person is a crypto millionaire that I meet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. fucking decentralized yeah musician that does psychedelics on a weekend and has somehow yeah. sold their company for so maybe they, maybe it doesn't matter but um it, it definitely feels like there's there's more of a leisure culture here you know people just say what are you doing at, at 2 p.m we're going out on the boat or some shit like that's not yeah, that's yeah. not the sort of thing that you would see in the uk yeah there's definitely uh, uh 
an idea. I, we, it depends on where you live, for sure. But um, there's a feeling here that people do. I think that's why the pandemic, people struggle so much. Because, I mean, our friends don't cook. Everybody goes out to dinner at least at least five nights a week. People go out a lot. And I think they work hard and then they, they, they like to play hard. And, in fact, some young people just moved into the building across the street from us, too. You know, so we can see their entire lives because they didn't bother buying curtains. But they party so much. And that's really great for them. Maybe a result of them being cooped up for 18 months, but also there's, there's a, a, a feeling of life moving quickly forward that we really feel when we're here. We feel like our lives in London really slow down when we're there, hmm. especially over the last two years, but definitely because yeah, we feel like there's a lot more people just go to a pub in the UK and they talk and they, they hang out and there's less of a feeling of having to be impressed there's some, I mean, my husband's Brazilian. He doesn't want to talk about people's income. He's totally embarrassed when we go to functions here because people go on oh, oh, about how important they are. And they, it's it's really, it's, I, I, I don't know. I think people want to feel when they're here as if they're on the forefront. Of it. We are in a place, again, Silicon Valley, where a lot's being created. There's, a, there's more wealth being generated here in the Bay Area than in any, any other place in the history of the world. So we're living in that. So and it's still poor. got that sort of frontier mentality. But definitely, but also because of what's happening right now. But California's always been a gold rush state. Things go up and down. I think maybe people here are a bit paranoid and freaked out and aware of that. And everyone knows, a lot of people know, that they're one paycheck away from being homeless themselves. And the kind of stress that that creates amongst people, yeah. you know, it, I think people here feel trapped. And what I mean is they're in a job where they're making a quarter million at Oracle to create an app. Um, and there's a team down the hall creating that same app. And if you fuck up, you're fired. And then you, they don't just punish you. They fire you. That's the contract you signed with Satan who runs Oracle. So now you're living out of your car in a beachfront community where all you can afford is decaf coffee in the morning. And you don't know what you're going to do with the kids. And you think, oh, you'll be welcome back into the social media community soon. You'll get it. But you're never welcome back. You lost the data. You're out. Get the fuck out. We don't even really want tourists here because we can't afford them. We can't afford you because we're paying for the homeless. They cost a lot. You cost more protecting you from people stealing your car or banging down the window of the hotel you stay in and taking all your luggage. All this shit's happening right now. So we can't afford to have visitors. Stay out. Get out. Don't come back. We don't want your dollars. We're I'll do my best. I will, I will do my best. Right, I want to talk about, um, I spoke to Douglas Murray about this a while ago, about the internal politics of the LGBT group. Right. And even calling it a group is kind of dumb. What Douglas brought up, and I keep on having this conversation because Austin's quite progressive, right? And there's a bunch of different people in there. The fact that the L's and the G's actually have nothing in common. Like they genuinely, there, there is nothing that those, those two groups have. Everyone, in Douglas's words, is a bit suspicious of the B's. They're not really too sure what they're doing there. They don't really know. They feel like they're L's or G's that haven't really committed. And then the T's, uh, in Douglas's words, are just working against everyone. So has the last time that I spoke about this was maybe two years ago, 18 months ago. Uh, has anything changed over the last 18 months? Well, we've added the I's and the Q's. What's the I's? Intersexual. What's that? I, I don't know. And we've added the, um, I think it means you're, what, you're whatever you say you are. Okay, so that's to do with gender expression. And then what's the cues? A questioning. I thought it stood for queer. No, we don't, you're not meant to say that word at all. That's not for you. That's like dropping the end, mom. That's for us to say. Okay. <laughs> unless, you want to whisper it, unless you want to whisper in the gay man's ear while you're standing in line for a drink at a gay bar, you can do that. <laughs> As a question. Yeah, or, or hey, queer, get out of my way. He'd be like, ooh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yes, and then there's a plus. Don't forget the plus at the end. The plus. Everything else. Because Every, we're desperate for conversation. Just dump any shit on the pile heap. We'll take it. We'll take anybody, right? We're trying to expand. Um, we're branching out. Yes, you know, I think it's all meant to seem inclusive. But there's two kinds of inclusive in my head. There's an inclusive where you don't all agree, and that's okay, like a table full of feminists. Uh, where they, a true feminist believes there's there's a seat for everyone at that table, um, or there's inclusive where you aren't really, which is these people who are attacking someone like the woman who wrote those books for children, where they have dragons and Enid Blyton, not Enid Blyton, no, the other one, yeah, her too, but um, that was a race they, thing, right? Yeah, the, the 
Harry Potter stuff. The author oh, of that. J.K. Rowling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who expressed her opinion, which is just her idea, and then she got death threats. So that's meant to be an inclusive part of a society, which isn't inclusive at all. And I think when you're trying to, it's like the U.S. It's too big. I think the LGBTIQ plus community is too large. I think you're right. I think when a lot of queers dropped dead from AIDS in the 80s and the dykes were like, we're going to take over the gay pride event in San Francisco because we can do it better. A lot of queers are like, you know what? Maybe you can because we're busy trying to count our T cells. So go for it. See if you can do that. And, um, and that's why they took the lead in the parade on their bikes. Now it's dykes with bikes on the parade. But fine. The queers couldn't walk anymore anyway. They, they fucking they couldn't move. They were they were dying. So. And they did pretty well, although what happened with the gay pride events, it was out of all of our hands anyway. It became commercialized. So now everything's so accepted and people bring their little meatloafs in baby carriages. Look at our babies. and We're buying beers. We're heterosexuals. We support Coors. Now it's all about product placement, which is what it was going to become anyway. And that's what brings our community together, which is buying and selling. Commercializing it. Yeah. So it's not a community based on you know, uh, community, community political thought or us banding together to save a group or making things better for certain people. Now it's just about us showing off for a gap ad, which is, I think, what upsets people the most. I mean, no one believes a bisexual anyway, but a bisexual in Levi's is even less impressive than, sorry, a queer with AIDS. We were more politically savvy and powerful when we were dying. And now that we're living, we're selling Coca-Cola and soap like everybody else. So I agree with you. I think the LGBTIQ plus is no longer necessary. I just don't think it is. I think gay people are still marginalized in certain communities. I think they are. In certain communities in the UK. Believe me, on the comedy circuit, I don't always feel safe purely because of my sexuality. But What do you mean when that, you say safe? I don't feel like walking back to my hotel room but on my own is necessarily a good idea when I'm in Stoke-on-Trent. I just don't. But that might also be because of my accent. And in fact, the first thing I have to do to out myself when I'm on a comedy stage anywhere in the world is, is explain why I'm American and I can, I'm still allowed to tell jokes. Because being American is what offends people. I don't find an audience that I have in a long time who's offended by the gay thing. It happens so infrequently. But what really gets people going is my accent. Ooh, ooh, they get, they get antsy and insy about that. That's what I first have to deal with. So... Yeah, I'm not really worried about the gay thing anymore. And, and I feel like you're right. The lesbian gay community probably never had that much in common anyway. Although I have to say, during the AIDS crisis, the lesbians were really there. They really, they really stepped up. They stepped up in terms of volunteering a lot. Because I worked in a lot of volunteering communities in, in San Francisco. Like the AIDS quilt, for example. The lesbians really did the, a lot of admin on that. Really a lot of admin. Because they were prepared. And they were healthy. And they administratively were, minded. They were, you said it, and they were valuable to gay men and really helpful. So in that way, that community bonded together. But again, they came together because of, of, of a virus. So maybe we should put the idea that we're all the same aside until we're in, in a common battle with something else. Mm. There was a, uh, speaking about J.K. Rowling, do you see that she had a photo taken outside of a house recently? You see this? Yeah, I've well, read about it. Yeah, J.K. Rowling has accused three people who campaign on transgender matters of posting a photo of her Edinburgh address on Twitter. The author, who had been criticised for her views on trans issues, has reported the matter to police. Police Scotland said they had made been made aware and inquiries were ongoing. In a now-deleted social media post, one of the groups said the photo had been removed after they had received threatening messages online. In her own Twitter thread, Rowling said that the image depicted three activists in front of her home carefully positioning themselves to ensure that the address was visible. So it's guerrilla warfare, I think. And I think that she's probably got a security system looking after her now if she didn't already. It's Madness that you don't already. I mean, the woman's worth an unlimited amount of money. And that's probably why she felt she needed one anyway. And now she's probably even more terrified. I mean, you know, the thing is, <laughs> I, look, I'm not going to take a stance on what she said. I think she's, her, her, her opinions are valuable. They're hers. I don't, I don't care. I, I still don't. don't I've never read her books. I'm sure she's a lovely person. Um, but you don't want to know what your, what your favorite author or actress or thinks. When I read a Streisand interview, I was like, oh, my God, she's out of her fucking mind. How have I been obsessed with her music for so long? She, Barbara Streisand has a museum below her house in Malibu 
I'll repeat this, a museum of herself below her house. This is documented. There's been a play written about it on Broadway. <laughs> when you go to her house, she might take you on a tour below her house of the cellar of all her awards and things about herself. She's out of her gourd. When she talks about herself, she does in third person. She's crazy, but she's Barbara. So I ignore all that, right? If you read about certain actors, they're anti-Semitic. I remember reading about an actor I won't mention here who I, I fucking love an American actor. I've watched all of his films, and he said in a quote that the Jews run Hollywood. So it's like, well, I guess I can't watch your movies anymore. But I do. I mean, you know, Eddie Murphy was a famous homophobe in his in his first video that won all those awards. The things he said about gay men were horrible. Then I met him when I lived in LA, waiting tables doing room service. I room serviced him on Academy Award night three years in a row because he wouldn't go to the Academy Awards. He'd watch him in his hotel room. He's five foot four. He sits on a stool and he's clearly homosexual. He's a little gay in tight pajamas. I was 25 that hit on me relentlessly. But I did the room service because it's Eddie fucking Murphy. It's complicated, isn't it? He's a brilliant comedian. There are certain things about people that make them interesting. And, you, and if that makes them interesting, you've also got to sometimes ignore that. This is the problem that we've got with social media facilitating mm. everyone to have an opinion and also yeah, yeah. everyone to share that opinion. Yeah, previously, previously you had to work to be able to get a platform of the size where even if you were an author, you know, if mm. you wanted to talk about your either well-informed or ill-informed opinion on whatever it was, you mm. still needed to find an outlet. It was through a newspaper or on mm. TV or whatever. Whereas now the brain to fingers filter has been completely removed and millions and millions of people all over the globe can see within seconds what your brain just farted out and then you decide yeah. to put it out there. The, the world isn't meant to consume everyone's innermost monologue in real time, 24 hours yeah. a day. Yes, it's true. And I think that it makes people braver too, uh, to 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 shout and yell, and it makes them feel like they have a bit of power when they felt so powerless for so long. There's that too, and and everyone's the star of their own video. They're on they're on all the Facebook, Instagram, whatever, and they're making movies about themselves all the time. TikTok, I mean, and, and their movie, their little video might get you know eight million hits, and they feel like they feel like now they have the power to say and feel what they want. You know, live. Yeah. I mean, in, in a way, I thought that the Internet as it progressed would make our lives easier, but it's made it, in fact, more confrontational. But the problem is, I think, that we, we very quickly went from a scarcity of information to a surplus of information in mm. the space of probably 10 years. So I think yeah. the optimal amount of information that we had on the Internet was m maybe like 2011 or something there. And then very, very, very quickly, you went yeah. from needing to be able to be good at finding information on the internet to yeah. being able to be good at discerning signal from noise on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best people, the smartest people that I know now are the most discerning ones, not the ones that go the deepest. They're the ones that are able to cut through all of the bullshit. Whereas, yeah, yeah. yeah 10 years ago, when we had that one day, whatever it was, November, the middle of November in 2011, that was, that was when we had the right amount of information. It was about, I, I thought it was always going to be about shopping. I never thought it would become more than that. I just thought it'd be about finding items online and, and purchasing them. Because I have collectibles. I will show you. My husband oh, hates them so much. In fact, I was just shopping for a, a mid-century ceramic um, coffee urn online before you and I spoke. In fact, you interrupted that, which pissed I'm me off. I'm sorry. It's all right. I found one, though. Um, but I thought that's what the internet was going to be. Ever, it would never be about. Because I thought people liked... I thought people that were looking for mission liked research and reading. But as it turns out, nobody does. As it turns out, everyone wants things in active, preferably current, like live images. I've seen so many images, live, not live, obviously, but filmed, of that car hitting those poor people in Wisconsin. Yep. Uh, who wants to watch that image? Apparently, people want to watch, you know, a journalist have his head cut off in the Middle East. People <laughs> want to see Outrage that. porn, isn't it? There's, I don't know. Really so here's, here's one thing that I've been thinking about since I've been out here. So Austin's got a big psychedelic culture, right? Which is people trying to connect. As much as you can talk about like hippy-dippy bullshit, um, they're trying to connect with two emotions that I think we're really missing, which is awe and dread. We don't often actually get to experience awe and dread anymore. And I wonder whether seeing 
uh, feeling indignation is kind of like an alternative for that. Like, I can't believe this happened. It's it's shock. It's outrage. It's indignation. I'm wondering whether people are supplanting what previously the night sky and some pretty nature would have done for us to make us feel small and insignificant, or perhaps a trip to church on a, on a Sunday to to you know feel like we we are connected with the wider universe. I wonder whether that it, it ticks some of the same boxes. I'm not sure. So you think social media is the new Jesus a little bit? I think that what it, fa- what, it, what it facilitates is um, outrageous videos that people can't believe have happened, yeah, and yeah. that emotion. Indignation's not far away from dread and awe, right. I don't think, when you see something that's completely shocking. Uh, and I wonder how much that's supplanted it. Like, did they put one nail through his feet or two? And people just, they can't imagine. And they get somehow turned on by it at the same point of being horrified by it. You know, I, I really feel like, because I, I still do, I, I'm a dinosaur, so I still make my living in hospitality, live performance, really. I'm a babysitter as a stand-up comic. And I really feel um, when I'm on stage, like people expect, they, they expect something so vivid and aggressive now from comedy that when they don't get it, they're disappointed. And I think that's been driven by what you're describing. How do you mean vivid and aggressive? I have people say to me, because I just did a weekend at a, at a mainstream club where I did five shows in three nights, hour-long sets. And I had people asking me to cover certain subject matter that I'm just, I'm not going to cover on stage. I'm not going to talk about that on stage. I mean, I don't have boundaries about material. I'll, I'll talk about anything really, but I, 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 people were like, Oh, you didn't push that far enough. You talked about that, but you didn't push it far enough. Like, you know, and it's like, look, everything's, everything goes to the nth degree now. So quickly, every subject becomes explosive really quickly. Like, you know, that woman who used to be fat, who isn't fat anymore, the British one. Adele. The, yeah, the, the chimney sweep who can, with five ranges. She, um, she was here with Oprah. And Oprah kept trying to goad her. And she's like, look, I can't. Uh, I've lost a bit of weight. Oprah's like, you've let so many people down. So many people are sad. They're suicidal because they're fat. And you're not anymore. That, it's like, Oprah, Jesus, rain it in. And she kept raining Oprah in saying, look, I've got to make a living. I've got to deal with my own shit. She was very funny, I thought. And live past 70 as well, hopefully. And she was very... It's just, you know what? Part of the reason why I started going to the UK 25 years ago to do stand-up was because um, the, the culture is less, less vis- vicious, less savage than the US culture. It feels- when I was on stage there, I didn't feel like... I mean, I felt... I came out in my first show I did there in Edinburgh. But it wasn't necessary, for one thing, look at me. But also... The audience, if you have tails and a horn, they don't care. It's just be funny. The British, they don't, they're not impressed or depressed by any of that. I mean, like I said, I don't feel always safe in certain environments when I'm in the UK. But that has very little to do with my being on stage. And I, I've always felt here like I lived in an explosive situation. And people want comedians to figure shit out for them sometimes. And now... You've got less time to figure stuff out on stage. People, they want it now. They want it faster. They want it more aggressive. They want it more brutal. They want it louder. Even the fact that comedy has become such a big business and you see comics performing in 10,000 seat arenas with the head mic on screaming at people for an hour. It's just become, everything's become, like I said, nth degree. And the argument is no longer, like I used to feel like I, one of the reasons why I preferred performing here in the U.S., in a way, sometimes, because I felt like I could have more, more of an extended conversation about race and politics here. But I don't feel that any, anymore here. I don't feel that. Do you not think that immediately anyone who looks remotely talented or has a platform gets co-opted into trying to take a stand on something? So, for instance, we had the Laurel Hubbard, who was the New Zealand transgender weightlifter who competed at the Olympics. And the other three women, I think it was the three women that she was competing with for the uh, that were most likely a podium were asked in, or it may have been af- afterwards, asked in a press conference, um, what do you think? Obviously, this is an incredibly unique opportunity. You're witnessing history unfold, and there's a nine second pause. And then one of the girls just leans forward, presses the button to activate her mic, and goes, No, thank you. <laughs> and just turns the mic off. And that, that to me, was really reassuring because you think these people are good at lifting heavy things from the ground to over their head. They're not, this isn't their role. 
Stop looking at these fucking athletes like they're supposed to be. I understand. I understand that if you are in a position of social gravitas, if you have talent, that you can use your platform in order to help uh, push forward a particular narrative because you have reach and people respect what you do. But that should be the anomalous case of the person who happens to the you know the cassius clay deciding not to go to vietnam thing mm. right like that mm. that that's an anomaly from history that's why it was so interesting it shouldn't be that every fucking person with more than ten thousand followers on some social media is now a platform and the reason for this is that every political party is trying to pick up whatever 0.0001 percent of influence that they can and just co-opt everybody in Yes, this person decides to stand with us or stand against us. Right. Well, I blame, you know, I blame Pontius Pilate in, in a way because he created Jesus into the first social media figure because Mary sold her son out because she wanted to be famous as well. So it all happened then. And people are still paralleling their lives to that. They still think I can win. You know, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think when comedians go on Twitter and try to fight a political opinion it's like just write a joke about it you're yeah. not a political activist. that's your out that's your outlet your outlet is to make this you're, funny and do it in a show use your voice as a comic <clears throat> but you know everything's everything's a, a talent contest now and for a lot of people that are wondering how they're going to make a living or, or get famous or be rich if they do a shocking video that'll there you do go it. there you go so have you you might have missed this because you don't strike me as a Joe Rogan listener, but Joe Rogan had Snoop Dogg on his show a couple of days ago, and he brought up that one of the reasons he thinks that they are getting people to focus on race is the fact mm. that it'll distract us from the fact that class is the real problem. Of course. Yeah, always has been. I mean, you know, Britain hides it better by denying it exists, but there's a, an ingrained class system there that the U.S. is embarrassed by because we tried to break away from it when we left, and it's... It's even more here. And here it seems based, you know, externally, you think it's based on income, but it's not. There's, there's an opaque 1% in this country that not only will I never meet, I'll never even know who they are. And they're running everything. So, yeah, there's a system here that, oh, that it seems to create a, a, a group of people that really have, have no, again, we talked about this, they, they have no empathy they have no reason to feel you know when i if you've been watching succession i know it's not a documentary but i've worked for rich people uh, many times for very very wealthy people and they're fucking miserable and they take it out on each other and um my family has a bit of money based on you know investment and property and the way my family treats one another is not that dissimilar from what you're watching on tv there's a lot of suspicion and threat because no one wants to be knocked down a peg. No one wants to go down a peg. And man, it, it's just here. Oh, there's so much. And some of my friends identify it as homophobia here in the US still. It's not when you're when, when people you know that are in positions of power treat you that way. It's class. Because they think if you've identified yourself in a subculture like the LGBT community in this country, that that's because you're a loser. And what they mean is that they themselves might suck cock as a guy, but they don't. But they would never identify as being gay because they don't see themselves as politically motivated by that community. And they're winners. They've been told they're winners their whole life. They went to Yale, they went to graduate school, they have a PhD, they teach at Stanford, they've got a wife, they've got kids, because that's what a winner looks like. And to be gay, to not have those things, to have your power reduced at that level, even and especially at the educational level, a higher education level in this country, makes you a loser. It's a class system. It's not about being queer. It's about being a winner. And if you have black skin, it's not your fault, but I, it identifies you in a certain way. And people associate things with you, which more, may be more media driven than anything else. But again, it's not about race. It's about Did whether you're at the top or bottom. Literally. Did you see that the Women's March group sent out an email with the average number of donations recently and the number was unfortunate? Do you see this? Well, <laughs> what do you mean unfortunate? Women's March group sent out an email with average donations and apologized for including 1492 in there, 
We apologize oh. deeply for the email that was sent today. 1492 was our average donation amount this week. It was an oversight on our part to not make the connection to a year of co colonization, conquest, and genocide for indigenous oh, people, oh, oh, especially before Thanksgiving. <sighs> it's not even the proper year. They're reading that from a crappy history book from their elementary school. It's a different year. It's all made up. Yeah, it's hilarious. God, that's funny. That was supposed See, to be the year that Christopher Columbus had stepped on American soil. He did, yeah. It is that year. Or so he said. Who knows? 1492, People, so that number itself, the, the average amount of donations was problematic. Yes. And he might have been in other parts of, of not the US, but in America before that. Other people were. Anyway, yes. Um, yeah. That's, that's something we're feeling bad about. But this is what I mean. Comedians don't have to be non-funny about this stuff or, you know, politically motivated in some correct way. There's so much material. That's one great thing about all this. That's why I miss Trump a little bit. There's so many jokes in all this. I mean, if you're not writing material about this, then you are a loser. I mean, if you are avoiding this stuff on stage, it's one thing I like about Rogan. You know, I've only worked with him once. Again, I was doing a weekend here in the city at the same club I discussed earlier, and he was popping in and he wanted to do his own show. So he, we closed my show and at midnight, he went on that same stage because it's such a popular club and did his own set and I watched him and I was, I was impressed. How fucking intelligent he is live. And I, I, wish, I, I wish he trusted himself enough on his own show. Not that I listen to every podcast, but I have listened to it. And I feel like he dilutes it a little bit, maybe just on the ones I heard. But he is a brainiac. He is. And, and I do like that he covers current subject matter in his sets and that he's funny about them. He may not agree with what he says. He may hate his politics, whatever. But all these people getting angry about a recent comedy show on Netflix – where the comedian went on about LGBT rights and trans rights, people just fucking lost their sum, quit their job, or protested, or blah, 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 over Chappelle's set. I watched it. It's Chappelle. He pushes the buttons. He does what Chappelle does. I wasn't offended in any way by what he said about the LGBT. In fact, I thought he said something brilliant about gay, you know, gay people are liberal until they're white, which is true. Can gay people be racist? Yes, they can. We have a whole racist subculture in the LGBT community that I won't go on about right now. But a lot of guys, when, what, are you a rice queen? Are you a sticky rice queen? Are you a brown rice queen? Are you a dinge queen? Uh, all these terms meaning skin color about who you're fucking. So yeah, gay people can be racist, if you're wondering. And he covered it. A lot of gay comics wouldn't go near that in their eyes. They wouldn't be brave enough. We have to wait till Chappelle does it, right? And then complain about it. You know, I feel bad, like Andrew said, Andrew Doyle, who's a friend of ours, for all those people who had a gun held to their heads and made to watch that set on Netflix. You don't have to watch it. Change the channel. Turn it off. No one cares about your fucking opinion about it. You know, if you're offended, you're good. People are offended by comedy all the time. That's because it works. They're just ideas. They're not going to hurt you. <laughs> Didn't you get, you got in some trouble on Australian TV for doing something. Yeah. Didn't you get cancelled from Australian TV? I've basically ago? never been invited back because of that. The entire country of Australia has a problem with you. There's a myth about it now, too. There's there's whole memes about it, and there's there's sayings, don't capuro me on this. You're not going to capuro us, are you? Meaning, you're not going to go on TV and do a different set than you promised, right? You're not going to get people fired from this network. You're not going to... So, the story is that I told jokes about raping the Virgin Mary. Now, I didn't tell those jokes, do you have any? Because if you have them and they're good, I'll tell them. Don't have them. What I talked about was Christ being on the cross and forgetting his safe word is what I talked about. But they had seen my scripted set and they had denied me a rehearsal. I won't defend myself in this. I don't have to. But what they did was change the story after my set came out live on TV to defend themselves. Now, at the time, this is, long, this is 20 years ago, I would have used it to push the show forward. That's what I would have done. Let's run with this. But they were cowards and didn't know how to do that. The Festival of Melbourne, my man's written in London, cowered to what they thought public opinion was. As it turned out, people thought it was hilarious who'd seen it, but they worried. People got fired at the network, I heard. And it became, it became a negative thing, which is now if it happened, because of social media, I'd be huge because of that. It would have had me, I would have toured the world, but at the time, and because the, the Australians, honestly, it, in media, are a bit homophobic. They, they really were then. It's like, why is the gay man in the room the smartest one with all the power? How did that happen? It's also complicated, too, because the show's host was a famously a closet case and didn't want his, 
in soiled or associated with in any way the gay, gay community there was a lot of shit going on that's something that i've noticed i did a, a talk at the start of the year and partway through it there was um a couple of emails that got sent to the group that were organizing it that said uh have you seen this have you seen what chris has been talking about and it was a link to a trailer on my instagram of me and douglas murray and douglas was talking about the Chaz chop autonomous zone and saying just being douglas right talking about it i don't talk throughout the entire trailer i don't say anything but i do laugh and they said that this laugh is uh, we're taking this laugh as the fact that he is agreeing this is a signal that he's agreeing with what douglas says are you really inviting this person so when that happened first off there's the indignation right you think this is absolutely insane for I, you know douglas's points are his own i was laughing it's my show it's a trailer from eight months ago the only reason that this would have been sent in by multiple people remembering it's a really old trailer is if it's a coordination on their part to get multiple people to send it in so on and so forth but for a moment i saw in that situation Oh, this could be, this could be my thing. This could be cancelled for a laugh. This could be, this is how I, this is how I could get myself onto Tucker Carlson. Or this is how I could get myself, you know, you do the tour off the back of it. You get the right people to retweet it. And you notice this, the opportunity arising. This could be my evergreen state for Brett Weinstein or my Bill C-16 for Jordan Peterson. Something innocuous that, that ends up blowing up in somebody's face. And yeah. that, that, like, I didn't follow through with it. They said, look, don't antagonize anyone. Don't reply on Twitter. Sure enough, the whole thing dissipated, went away, did the talk. It was absolutely fine. But for a moment, I saw in the less gracious part of my nature a bit rise up and say, this could be, this could be the beginning now. And the same way that we have perverse incentives, I think, for potentially some people that are involved in cases as jurors or as judges or as whatever, the lawyers... Um, I think that you have this with cancellation now, that some people almost go out of their way. Like, cancellation's the new Love Island. If you manage to get cancelled somewhere, not sufficiently bad that the public hates you, but bad enough to garner a little bit of attention, that's your yeah. springboard to a career. As long as you're not kitty fiddling, anything else, people will come out and see you, I think. And, yeah, I think it's the only way to sell papers now, to put bad news on the front of them. And bad news becomes good. Because suddenly you're recognized. But they've said for a long time, right, any publicity is good publicity. I think Harvey Firestein was criticized for saying that decades ago uh, during the AIDS crisis, that any publicity for gay men is good because it gets us out there and makes us more real. I think it was Harvey. But either way, that's, I, I think, always been the case. And now it doesn't take a, a, a media facility like a newspaper or a network to promote it. You can do it out of your home. I just feel like, though, <laughs> he laughed how dare he it's like <laughs> it makes odd. i just did a show at a, at a very kind of uh upscale kind of area on saturday night uh the wine country here and it was sort of and um beautiful little room a tasting room and i did a comedy show there the staff are great very supportive but the audience were just so clammed up like a lot of very the whole room was white except for one black guy he was enjoying it. But the rest of the room were a lot of like 20 to 35 year old white women with their arms crossed, just very anxious about just about everything I said on stage. Now, I've been doing this for quite a while. And if you pay to come see me, eh, you kind of know what you're in for. I mean, I'm no, I'm no surprise. It's the same old shit rehashed every fucking time is how I am. That's my act. So it, but, but they're getting more, just more about everything, which makes me poke and prod. And the more they restrict, the more I push. Uh, you know, so at the end, a bunch of people, we really enjoyed it. I'm said, you, I, you might reflect that in your response next time then. And I might think about coming back because I, I'm not here to be your sounding board to see if it's okay if you laugh at this and then laugh at it in the car on the way home. I don't want to be a part of that conversation. I want the conversation in the room. But one thing that I find with all that's going on around us with social media and people being terrified of being caught on camera responding, like you just said, is that immediate response is stifled so i'm terrified about people not actually telling me what they think it really fucking freaks me out oh so they've got a public persona and a private persona and to think that you're going to leave the room and that suddenly what people actually think about you is going to be voiced i fucking hate that it's why i never talk negatively about comedians people i work with there's no point in it anyway it's not going to get you anywhere but i don't if i feel badly about somebody i'll just tell them i never want to be that person leaving the room that becomes a kind of you know a burden 
oh, it just fucking freaks me out. So here's, so, a, here's an interesting element of that from my industry, which is nightlife. And when I first started doing club nights and my first ever event was a big bar crawl where people would buy a t-shirt and your t-shirt was your ticket. And there was tasks on the back, like pull a pig, get off with three randoms, uh, down a drink with somebody that you don't know, like get a piggyback from one venue to another, blah, blah, blah. And people used to write on the inside of their arms, the first half of the alphabet and the second half of the alphabet. And you have to tick off the letters of the first name of the person that you'd kissed. And, you know, you're running around at the end of the night trying to find a Zara or something. And, um, I wondered, I never thought about it, but I had a conversation with a buddy who did the same thing as me, the same franchise, but down south. He was saying, where's that culture gone? Where's that kind of sloppy, very, very casual, transactional, mm. uh, physical relationship shit gone for 18 to 21 year olds, specifically in the UK, but maybe in the US as well. And he said his idea was that because of the advent of smartphones, no one can ever do anything in public that's private anymore. You can never get off. You can never pull a pig on a bar crawl without five videos of that now haunting you for the remainder of your days. That's going to be with you. If you decide to do something and that's caused people to have far more scruples about how they behave publicly, that was his idea. And that, I don't know if it's true, but it fucking makes a lot of sense. It does. I think, you know, no one can wake up and say, I don't remember what happened last night anymore. Because someone holds the camera up to you and say, this is exactly exactly what happened. Yeah, exactly. So you can't have a hangover and forget about it. And I think, you know, that makes people like this, this kid, this trial that's going on uh, right now in the U S about this um, African-American man who was hunted down by two white guys and, and murdered in the street. You know, the people, they don't just have witnesses because witnesses are tricky. And you, you know, the trials can never really trust witnesses because people see all sorts of things differently, but a lot of it's on film. <laughs> so the guys themselves filmed it. It's why, you know, Hitler's still with us, you know, the big H is still so popular because it was really the first kind of fascist, it was a fascist revival, but really the first international battle that was filmed. The wars before that, we're not so sure, but Hitler put everything on cinema. And um, that's why he's still such a big draw, I think. And so people see all that and think, you know, I got to, I got to keep my job and I can't keep my job if they see me. To what you described, because so much of it can be like also what you said can be perceived as as less casual and less fun and flirtatious, but you can perceive it as being misogynistic or racist. So you got to be careful. Interpretation is like always open like that, right? I mean, no one can say. I mean, you know, there are so many things that people feel they can't reveal about themselves because it might like it might be seen as a preference, which is racism, right? If you have a preference, you're racist right away. So you got to be careful. I mean, I'm, I don't have these boundaries in, in the way that I work and what I do on stage. But I certainly don't. There's a few things I won't say anymore. I never thought I'd say that, but it's true. Why? She's only for too long. Well, I don't drop the N-bomb on stage anymore. I used to, and there's a purpose behind it. And I don't drop the P-bomb anymore. Because you'll just lose them for too long. Before, you'd lose them for about 30 seconds, and then they recover. And I could manage that. But now, they'll just completely stop listening. So, there's no point. Talking about Rogan, he's got a new bit in his stand-up show where he's talking about why he'll still use the word retard, but he won't use the N-word. And he's <laughs> talking about it for ages and going back and forth. And they say, yeah. well, what is it about the word retard that means that you will say it and about the N-word that means that you won't? And he says, it's because I'm a lot more scared of black people than I am of retards. <laughs> it's a great uh, line. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so uh, wrong. And I, I'm talking about right now why my husband, wants to, he, he talks about having children all the time. And I talk about how I, I only want a downs. I only want a downy. If I'm going to have a kid, I want to be a downy. And so I think I... I escape using the word retard in that bit because if I do, the the, the the empathy I'm trying to put forward, I lose it. But if you have a good joke about look, when I teach a comedy course I do in London sometimes, um, in Isla, in um, Stoke Newington, um, when I try to find funny people in that area and teach a comedy course to them, I do ask them, and I've been told to do this by other comics, one good challenge is to ask them to write a rape joke. First thing they should do write a rape joke because they're hard to write but if you learn to write a good one that's great i've got about 30 in my act 
And I still tell them, but because they're good and I got to kill time. Um, but I'm not going to kill rape because it's a money maker. And if you can write a, a brilliant one, great. And there is still an audience that wants to laugh. And there's still an audience that wants to write those letters on their arms. And there's still an audience that wants to have a couple of drinks and do something they can forget about. And that's, I think, the majority of us. And when I talk to people in Britain who are audience members, when I stay after and chat with them, I'm relieved. And it, res rel it, 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 I find it restorative for what I do because they just want to have a good time. You know, there's so many reasons for me to be nervous about performing in front of, say, um, Army and Navy guys who go to the comedy store a lot in London on their time off. Because the Army and the Navy in, in the UK and the US have, have this image of how they are, right? Which might not be inviting to someone like me, not just gay, but American and flamboyant and flirty on stage and dirty and unnecessary, and, you know, nauseating. But when I talk to those guys after, they're like, you are perfect. We'd love to have you so many times. You, we would love to. I'm like, even with my accent, they're like, we love Americans. And the American soldiers show up. It's a party. You would kill in Crete. You would kill in Cyprus. You, but then I call these companies to book me. And they're, they just will. They just will not. They won't want to. They don't want Americans. They don't want gay men. They don't want, some, they don't want someone my age. They don't want someone white. There's so many reasons to not book me, you know. And I, if I only talked to industry people in my business, I would quit. But the audience is great. And gay man's the new white man. That's the problem. Well, I think, you know, I think the gay thing is now normalized. And that's why I can't get away with as much as far as people are concerned on stage, because we're not naughty anymore. Yeah. Just like you. Yeah. So well, Douglas, Douglas had this bit from the madness of crowds where he said, you know that your minority has been completely assimilated into a culture when you have to put up with the same level of shit of everybody else. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, I mean, believe me, the stuff I used to get away with on stage, it's, it's more difficult now, which makes it more appealing to me, like how to find a way. Because that's always been the challenge of stand-up is, is to be relevant. And it doesn't mean because you're older that you can't be. And I don't think an audience thinks when I walk on stage, oh, he's old, I don't want to listen to this. So a couple of young people might think he's a dinosaur, but I don't think they do. I think, again, they just want to enjoy themselves. So it's up to, it's up to us to make our language accessible. But that's always been the case. To make a story from a stranger make sense in front of a room full of strangers. So that's what we have to do. When, when comics complain, oh, they're too, the audience is so woke, or we're being canceled, or you can't say this, like, no, 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 no. You need to find a way to make your act accessible. They've paid. It's not their job to dissect your act to make it funny. That's up to you. So... Scott Capuro, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to keep up to date with whatever you're doing or harass you online, where should they go? My website. It's all about me, me, me. So all the information's there. It's just my name, scottcapuro.com. Listen, oh. thanks for calling. It's great to see you. I know. Wait, Austin, I, it's been really fun to do this. I forgot that we were doing it, and, I, and then I remembered how much I wanted to, and now I'm really glad we did. Me too, so, man. Me too. Uh, when are you back in the UK? Are you back anytime soon? January 19th. My husband's craving to get back. He is so sick of this country um yeah so we're gonna yeah january 19th but I'll, and i'll see you there yes you will do your, and uh thanksgiving enjoy today? thanksgiving tomorrow well thank you too are you stuffing anything or are you going to be waiting Scott, come on we've managed to we've managed are to you cooking the... anything are you no, of course waiting? not of course i'm just yeah i'm just i'm turning up i'm the i don't know what i am i'm the token brit at the don't table don't you want to learn how to cook the tur turkey it's so fun it's about you feel like are you doing it? Are you doing it tomorrow? Oh, yes, yeah, so easy to do. You make the stuffing in 10 minutes, you shove it in, you put it in the oven, and you leave it. You don't, you never open the oven again. And four hours later, it pops out. And people are so impressed, you've done almost nothing. It's great. I'll have you to ring you. I'll FaceTime you tomorrow if I'm struggling. All right. All Let right. me know. Catch you later on. Cranberry Scott. sauce. Right. 10 minutes. <laughs> have a great one. Thank you, Chris. Nice to see you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here. For a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks and don't forget to subscribe peace <laughs>